Amen. You know, actually, that's why we didn't have announcements, the video announcements. Nathan was preoccupied. I don't know what, 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 what's the issue with that. I mean, where's the priorities in life, you know? But Friday night was a great picture. Last week, as I began teaching, I said the next three weeks I step into with great trepidation. Part of the reason is, is that I told you last week that I think that we're one degree off in terms of biblical community. Um, I also think that there are many people who don't understand your spiritual gifts, which is what we're talking about today, or you don't utilize them to the best of your abilities that God has given you to be able to do that. But at the same time, we're at this wedding, and the reception was a huge church. There were about 350 people there, and it was at this huge church. And all you saw in terms of people serving the meal at the whole reception afterwards were about 30 or 35 people from this church were just there, just serving. And Tamara and Robert Krauss um, did a great job. If you'd have walked in and not known they were from our church, you'd have thought that they paid $10,000 for that dinner. It was incredible. And so I look at that, and I talked last week about biblical community, and then I walk into this Friday night fellowship, scenario, and that, folks, is what the church is supposed to be. For that night, for one night, we were just as the body of Christ building up the body of Christ. And how right you are, Nathan and Taylor are special people. Normally, when I speak at a wedding, I will speak through marriage and what marriage looks like. And I could not do that at this, at this ceremony. I had to talk about God's call on their life. And that's really where we went with everything we talked about. Young couple, she's 22, he's 23. They don't have a, two nickels to rub together. And yet, you know what? They want to be in ministry. They want to serve Christ. They want to do everything they can. And Nathan has been at this church. People don't know that he has been engaged in this church more since he hasn't been able, well, not been able, he doesn't have set hours now at his other church, at least right now. So that time that he's not there, he's come here to help us. So when you see today all of the flyers, all of the explanations of ministries, when you go to look at the ministries of this church, Nathan's the one that put those together. We all sat down and put them together. And Nathan's the one that found out where we could buy these, these signs for each one of the ministries. That is a picture of God using a spiritual gift set of a person. And Nathan has a passion for service, and he has a passion for missions, and he loves the lost. But the truth of the matter is, he is a great example of the difference between an ability and a spiritual gift. Nathan has the spiritual gift of evangelism. He is a missionary at heart. That was given to him by God because in his own nature, Nathan is way introverted. And he says, I'd rather do anything, lock myself in my room, than to go to some foreign country or to walk to Fort Morgan or whatever I'm going to do for ministry. And yet God called him to do that. And you see that within him. You see when he is, he is sharing what Christ has put on his heart you see that it's really not him as much as it is the Spirit of God in him. And so that's what we're talking about today. We're in week 17 of this series of called Believe. And what we're really doing is talking about the beliefs, the practices, and the virtues of the Christian life. And right now we're, par parked, we're really parked on the practices. And today we're going to talk about spiritual gifts that God gives us. And so today brings up the key question, what gifts and abilities has God given me to serve other people. And the answer it becomes the key idea that God wants me to know my spiritual gifts and to use them to fulfill God's purposes. And finally, the picture for today, the biblical picture, comes from Romans chapter 12, which is one of four places in the New Testament that talks about spiritual gifts. And it says this, For just as each of you has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ... Though many form one body, and each member belongs to the others. Now we have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. And I'm aware of something. I'm aware that when I say this, the, the words spiritual gifts, 
for some of you, your eyebrows raise, or for some of you, the hair stands up. Because for some of you, you don't have any clue what I'm talking about when I talk about spiritual gifts. For some of you, you've had an awful Christian experience in a church somewhere. And for some of you, you just don't have a clue what your spiritual gift is. And it doesn't really matter what level you come from. God has a gift for you. God has a plan for your life. And so what I want to do today is bring to light some of that. I want to bring to light what God has for you. And I want to begin with a reality. And the reality is this. God is a gift giver. Isn't that awesome? God is a gift giver. And that's pretty cool because who doesn't like gifts, right? I mean, we all love gifts. And he has given the gift of life and he's given the gift of salvation and many of you have probably accepted that and some of you may not have yet, but he still offers that gift to every one of us. And he's given gifts like family and like friendship and like health and like food and like clothing and like shelter. It, all those type of things, God has given us those gifts, but here's the thing, there's more. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God plopped into your being at least one spiritual gift. One gift that will allow you to serve him to the fullest of your life. To serve and build up the church, the body of Christ. Now I want you to do this. I want you to imagine yourself being a child. For some of us that's probably not too hard to do. <laughs> but imagine yourself being a child and you think, I, I'm not going to get a gift this Christmas. And so you have very low expectations and then you walk out on Christmas morning and you look under the tree and there's this gift. And this gift has your name on it. It has your name on it. And so you take it and excitedly unwrap that present. And what you find is it isn't some plastic toy trinket that your father gave you from a store, went to the store and bought it. No, what it is is it's this handmade, handcrafted, designed by your father toy. And it's the most awesome, coolest toy you've ever seen in your life. And you unpack it and you are just so excited. First of all, I didn't think I was going to get a present. And now I have this gift and I've been opened up this gift. And this gift is from my father to me. It's not an afterthought. His secretary didn't go buy it. It's from my father to me. Similarly, in the Christian life, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, he does, very the, same th he does the very same thing. So the question becomes, are you ready to unpack your gift? Are you really re ready to really begin to see what that gift is? But before we do that, our name of our sermon today actually is in a question form. And it's what's so spiritual about your spiritual gift. In other words, how do spiritual gifts differ from things like talents or skills or abilities? Now that's a really good question, isn't it? How does a spiritual gift, what does make that different than anything else? Well, I'll give you a very short answer to that. First, a talent. A talent you're born with. Second is a skill, a skill you learn by experience and practice and time. The more you do it, the better you get at it. But a spiritual gift, that's given by the Holy Spirit from the Father in heaven. And sometimes it's given as you need it and you are given at least one gift that is how you're going to live out your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are some abilities like teaching and administration, and there are many more than that, but they can be learned skills, they can be like innate talents, or they can be spiritual gifts. So what's the difference between those things? You need to understand this comes directly from Scripture. A spiritual gift, <clears throat> it's given to each of us, each of us so that we can help each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's the clincher. <clears throat> a talent or a skill is to develop for yourself. Like you use your talents and your skills for your job. Things like that. But a spiritual gift, it is given for other people. That's what it is. So the number one thing that you need to fill out in your outline is a spiritual gift is given to benefit others and advance God's kingdom. Now can God use my talents and my skills and my innate abilities? Oh you bet He can. He does it all the time, doesn't He? He uses what He has given me in terms of those talents and abilities if I will surrender them to Him. 
But you need to understand there is a difference between me giving something to God for him to use and God giving something to me so that I can use for his kingdom. Because here's what usually happens. I've got strengths and I've got abilities and I've got a comfort zone and I've got a box that I live in. And as long as everything is filtered through that, then I'm okay. And so I want to live in those strengths only. And I, want, I become complacent in that. So if something comes up, then I say, okay, well, this is something I can do. This is something that I'm able to do or capable of doing, and we want to step into that. When many times what God does is he gives me something, a nudging, a gift that's beyond me. It's something that only he can do through me. And there's a huge difference between the two. And here's why this distinction matters. When I'm living in my own strengths, and we can have an entire church that does this, that lives in my own strengths, I've got mechanical ability. So I can live in that strength and in that strength only. So that you know, I do not have the gift of, 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 of preaching. I don't have that gift. It was given to me by God. I never had that gift. It petrifies me to do this. But I've had the gift of mechanical ability. So if we have a whole church of people that are going to only do what their innate talents and abilities tell them to do, then the world outside is going to look in and they're going to say, there's a bunch of really good people. There's a bunch of people that love Jesus. But they're not going to see a church that is doing things only God can do. And that's the church God wants. He wants a church filled with people who want God to work outside their scope of comfort. God wants us to work into the kingdom that he wants to establish on this earth. Isn't that what the, the Our Father says? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's kind of the way he does it. So what's so spiritual about your gift? You may want to jot this down. It is God working directly through you. You get that? God is working directly through you to love and serve others for the purpose of building up his church. Now, the reason that I wrote out that reading that we did just before communion is how much I love how 1 Corinthians 12 and the speaking of spiritual gifts and 1 Corinthians 13 and the speaking of love, how they go together because that's how Paul intended it. Paul intended for our spiritual gift to be lived out in love. That's really what he talks about. And so when I loved how that showed. As a matter of fact, there are four places in the New Testament that talks about our spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4. And you may want to jot those down. I'm going to say again, it's 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, Romans 12, uh, Ephesians 4 and first and um, and first Peter 4. Now, if you go read those, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see that every one of those is connected with love. And that's what I loved about this scripture that we talked, to, talked about. Because you know what? The issue is about your love of Christ and how that spreads out to your love for other people. But there's something else about our spiritual gifts. God gives us people spiritual gifts as a way of expressing that love toward, for, or to one another. Now the point Paul's trying to make in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 is that having spiritual gifts does not necessarily make you spiritual. Now you can have a spiritual gift. In fact, we can have a church of every, where everybody, 100% of the people in the church are living out their spiritual gift but if they're not living it out in love, then it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It means absolutely nothing if you're not doing it in love. Because what it ends up becoming is something that becomes more self-serving than for the glory of God and the building up of His church. But I'll tell you something else. When people understand that Christ has called me to the main thing, what is the main thing? We talked about it last week. Jesus is the main thing. Loving as Jesus loves is the main thing. And when we make that connection about biblical community from last week, and it's all about Jesus, and the main thing is Jesus, and the main thing is that I'm to love God and I'm to love others, and the main thing is I'm to love as Jesus loves because Jesus is the main thing, then guess what happens? 
The world gets blown away by the love of Christ. I got to tell you, Friday, Nathan got up, and when he was sharing about his love for his wife and his love for everything else, you know what one of his main topics was? This church. And how grateful they were for the people of this church. And how amazed they were at the party that they put on. We were in a church that probably has 15,000 people in it. And here 35 people were serving 350 people. I truly, with all my heart, believed that the people that were in that church looked at that and said, wow. These people were all volunteers. They didn't get paid for anything that they did. That, folks, is the type of, of feel, the type of life that Christ wants in the church, where I am desiring to be part of the church. I am desiring for the church to become the force, at least here in Lakewood, Colorado, for the kingdom of God. And how God does that is he uses spiritual gifts. But he wants us to be unstoppable, so those spiritual gifts need to be used in love. And like I said earlier, every believer in Jesus Christ has at least one gift. No one is overlooked. Now, other people may have two or three gifts, and maybe you only have one gift, but God gives the gift to you that he absolutely knows that you need. And that gift is going to be built, build up the kingdom of God. And here's one thing you need to know about spiritual gifts. We don't compare. God doesn't compare. When he gives you a spiritual gift, he doesn't say, and I really want you to use that gift like Larry uses it. He doesn't ever say that. He says, I want you to use that gift to be the best you that I created you to be. That's why I want to grow you into who you are to become in your relationship with me. It's so important to understand that. We look at other people with something as simple as prayer, and we think we can't pray. We get very insecure because I can't pray the way that person prays. And I go home tonight, and I say, oh, Lord, help me. And then when I get to heaven, Jesus is going to say, that was the most beautiful prayer I ever heard. And you may not know that until then, but you will know that someday. We do not compare. This church, any church, is only as strong as the weakest person spiritually in the church. So God wants us to use our gifts to build each other up. That's why they're to be used in the kingdom of God in the church. So that we can build each other up to make a difference in this world. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says this. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Now, depending on who's counting, there's between 15 and 25 spiritual gifts, depending on where you're going, who's counting. Now, in your, in your worship guide, I put about 20 of them in here for you. And there's a lot of ways that you can divide spiritual gifts. There's a lot of ways you can do that. I just put them under three categories. Service gifts, speaking gifts, and sign gifts. And then you can look at those. I don't need to read each one of these out for you. But if you look at that, you can see that the, God gives these abilities, these gifts to people after they become Christians. Like I said, you can also have a talent and an ability before. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But the truth of the matter is that each one of the spiritual gifts reacts to situations differently. That's why we need all the spiritual gifts in the church. Let me give you an example. Let's say that one of you spills coffee today. I'm going to give you these, some of these spiritual gifts and then the reaction that a person would have. If you have the gift of service, the person would say, let me help you clean it up. If you have the gift of mercy, I'm so sorry that happened. Let me give you another cup of coffee. If you have the gift of giving, here, you can have my cup. If you have the gift of administration, Josh, would you just get them up? Carol, would you just pick, up, pick this up? Misty, can you go get another cup of coffee for him? If you have the gift of faith, where God empties one cup, he fills up another one. If you have the gift of teaching, if you, pay a, if you paid attention, you wouldn't spill your coffee the next time. The gift of exhortation. Maybe you should let someone else hold your cup of coffee for you. The gift of wisdom. No, no use crying over spilled coffee. The gift of miracles. Let's ask God to put coffee back in the cup. 
The gift of healing. I'm praying against any physical or emotional trauma caused by the spilling of your coffee. Finally, prophecy. If you keep on doing that, you're going to get burned. I mean, this is funny, but those are different reactions to the very same instance, right? So you've got an idea of the spiritual gifts. That, really what I wanted to accomplish with that is just to give you an idea of what the spiritual gifts are, how they look in the kingdom of God. But how do I discover my gifts? Well, I'm going to give you four ways to do that. Uh, one way is to seek the giver of the gifts first. Please, seek the giver of the gift first. Listen to what it says in John 14. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. And he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Now, the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives in you now and later will be in you. Now, here's what you need to understand. Spirit of God comes into your life, and with that, he brings whatever that gift is. But God is not a gumball machine. That you put money and he's up in heaven and gives you whatever gift you want. He, that's not who God is. God knows the gift you need and he's going to give you the gift you need. And he knows how you're going to be able to live that out. So you always, the gift is always secondary to the giver. Relationship is the key. Relationship with your father and with other people is the key. So you need to seek God first. You need to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You need to surrender to him. You need to obey to him because the main thing is Jesus. And the gift is a result of my relationship with Jesus. Now the turning point with me was about 25 years ago. And I'd become like, I guess, very frustrated because I wanted to serve God, but in all honesty, I didn't feel like I had a spiritual gift. And so the Lord and I had a lot of shouting matches about this. And you know what I came to the conclusion of? You may want to jot this down. I came to this conclusion. God is far more concerned with who I am than in what I can do for him. I'm going to repeat that. God is far more concerned with who I am than what I can do for him. I had been thinking of the gift. I had been pursuing the gifts and I hadn't been pursuing the Savior. I hadn't been pursuing the relationship with God that I needed to do. And you know what I decided? I decided no longer do I want to say, what, do you, what, what can I do for you, God? I changed my focus. It went from what can I do for you, God, to God, how do you want to work in and through me? There's a difference between those two things. Because what we do is we want to just do something and say, God, give me approval for that. But when you seek God and what he wants to do through you, that becomes a different story. Nathan is a great example. You know, another great example of this is, is Joseph Parker. Joseph Parker does not have one inkling of a gift of worship. And yet Joseph Parker stepped into that. And when you see him helping to lead worship, his spirit resounds. He's very insecure about his voice. I mean, you know, he said, well, compare me to Don. Don's got like this rock star voice, and I don't. And yet, he was willing to step into that. Those are just examples of how God will take us beyond ourselves. He wants us to obey him. He wants us to just look at how do you want to work in and through me because that changes the way I do everything. That allows me the courage to go up to someone if I'm an introvert and say, I just need you to know God told me to tell you he loves you. Or God told me to tell you not to worry about this or whatever it is. You can't do that on your own. That's a prompting of God that he gives to you that allows you to be able to step out the way you need to step out. And the truth is God is far more interested in your character than in your charisma. You need to understand that. You know what charisma is? Charisma comes from the Greek word for gift. God is more interested in you as a person in building you up, get this, for eternity, not just today or tomorrow. He is building your gift set to serve him in eternity. Have you ever thought about that, that when we get to heaven, we're not just going to sit around playing harps? We're going to have jobs. <laughs> but here's the thing. There'll be jobs that don't put food on the table. There'll be jobs to glorify God and love each other. And he's now working on those gifts 
to bring you into eternity. But we need to let him. We need to seek first the giver of the gifts so that we can live into the gifts that he has given us. So it's all how important it is that you understand that. So here's the thing you need to, you might want to jot this down. He looks for someone with the right heart and then he equips them with the right gifts. In other words, God isn't out there looking for someone to do this job. God's looking for someone who has a heart to do what God wants him to do. And then you're going to live into those gifts because he's going to give you a job, I guarantee you that. Secondly, not just do I seek the giver first, but then I open the gift. I just open. If you're a believer, you've been given a gift. But many of you haven't opened it yet. And for some of us, it's like it's wrapping paper and we're afraid of the wrapping paper. So we don't dig in and open the gift. And there are four types of wrapping paper, I guess, if you want to use that metaphorically, that I want to talk about. There's four reasons that I come up with that keep you from opening up the spiritual gift God has for you. The first one is this. It's sin. Listen to this scripture. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So get rid of all bitterness and rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well of all types of evil behavior. That comes from Ephesians chapter 4. Sin in our life grieves God's Holy Spirit. And when sin grieves the Holy Spirit, it puts up a wall. And we can't become everything that God wants us to be. It puts a wedge in the relationship. Have you ever been in relationship and you've like almost, almost physically felt a wall come up? And all of a sudden there's this block and are we okay? That happened to me once in this church when I was talking to some people. And I said, here's my goal for, for this ministry in the church. And... I pulled out Philippians chapter 2. talked about Philippians chapter 2 last week. And I pulled it out, and immediately I sensed this wall. It was incredible. I've had that happen with my own kids. I've never had that happen with my wife because I'm the one that put the wall up first, right? But the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes you feel those walls come up in a relationship, and that's what sin does. It creates a wall, a barrier between we, me and God. Now, can God use sinners? Please don't make any mistake. God uses us all the time. It has nothing to do with God, with me being perfect in order for God to use me. I am telling you, we sin all the time. What it has more to do with is my willingness to admit it. My willingness to face that sin, look at that sin, take it to God, and repent of it. Because when I do that, the wall comes down. And I want you to note that that wall is never brought up by God. I can guarantee you that the 457,337 times I've taken sin to God in my life, never once, never once did God step away from me. I'm always the one that stepped away from God. And I just couldn't see he was there. That wall prevented me from seeing his love in my life. And so I wasn't able to live in that love. I wasn't able to sense or feel that love. And oh, how my heart breaks for those of us who just choose to live in sin like it has no consequence in our lives. And then we get so numbed that we don't even recognize we're living without God. It's crazy. Do you know you can be a Christian You can say yes to Jesus Christ and then never grow in him. Never take one issue, one sin to him. Never go to him and say, I'm sorry for this. Forgive me that I did this. Help me to do better next time. And then we get to the other extreme. Well, I've repented of the same thing so many times that I might as well give up and just live into it. Truth of the matter is, every time you take it to God and you say, God, help me, God, help me, God, help me, You've repented of that sin. It's a lot like forgiveness. I've heard people say, well, I never really forgave them. Every time you get on your knees and say, God, I forgive them, I don't care what you feel. When you go to God and you say, God, I forgive that person, it's peeling another layer of onion. And eventually one day you're going to say, God, I forgive that person, and there will be complete freedom. 
But that doesn't mean you never forgave that person before. That is an attack of the devil. And when you have something you're dealing with in life and you act out and you go to God, help me, help me, he's there. He is right there hearing you, listening to you, pouring grace into you to live better the next time. Then there's a second one. Stubbornness. We talked about Stephen just a couple of weeks ago. Now, Stephen here is talking about religious leaders. Listen to this. You stubborn people. You are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Now, interesting, he says you are heathen at heart because outwardly they were really religious. But he said you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did and so do you. See, when our sin brings sorrow on the Holy Spirit, it also brings conviction. Somehow we think we're not supposed to be convicted. We're supposed to feel okay all the time. I can't tell you the number of times I have had to tell a person that comes to me for counseling, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to feel bad about what you did. That is okay. That is God's love pouring into you, that tells you that you have spiritual life in you. Because there's people that will do whatever they want and they don't feel anything about it. Conviction is actually God's way of showing you my spirit lives in you and you're grieving the spirit of the living God, so stop it. But we can resist that. We can become stubborn. We can decide, you know what, I'm just going to pretend it isn't there. Or even worse than that, I'm going to excuse what I do, you know. That's what we'll do. And we'll come up with all the reasons why we don't do something rather than just going to God and say, oh, I have messed up again. I can't tell you the number of times I've gone to Christians and I've said I'm sorry about something. And they look at me and say, it's okay, brother. They're ready. They're ready to forgive. But you can't do that. I would never get that. I would think that person hates me for the rest of my life if I'd never gone to them. It's the same with your heavenly father. You don't know the depth of his love and forgiveness for you until you test it, until you bring it to him and see how he can change your life as a result of it. And then there's another thing. This may be the worst of all. It's complacently. It's complacency. You just don't care. God, you just want God to meet your needs and You're not attentive to the things around you because you just want God to meet your needs. And when he prompts you to step out to help meet the needs of other people, you just falls on deaf ears. And I don't care. I got my own agenda. I got my own thing going on. And you just become complacent. And you don't think it'll make a difference. Finally is suppression. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Evil. Something Some of you know exactly what God wants you to do. And yet, you know what? You're hoping that it'll eventually go away. Because if I step into that, it will cost me something. So I'm not going to do it. Or you know what? What we do is we, sometimes we pray and God doesn't answer our prayer. And what do you do? You get mad at God, right? And so we get mad at God and we just step away from God. Say, forget you. You're not going to answer my prayer and I'm not going to do what you want me to do. See the games we play with God? And holy smokes, do we suppress the things He wants to do in and through us as a result of that. We stifle the Spirit. Sometimes we just decide, God, you don't get it. This isn't the way I do it, so I'm not going to listen to you. How many ways do we do this? Not unwrap the spiritual gift that God has given us. And you can see how any of these create that wall that won't allow Christ to penetrate into me. Caratush, that woman, she was hurting yesterday. I mean, this, this was a rock star week for this church. You know, Robin and Lissa Baca got married yesterday. And Kara Tush was at the, at the wedding the day before. Kara Tush was here yesterday serving at that wedding. It was incredible. Katie West was doing the same thing. It's incredible to see that in a person. They get it. So the third thing is, 
Once you've received it and once you've opened it, you give it away. Remember the gift is not for your benefit, it's for the benefit of others. Uh, Romans 12, in His grace God has given us different kinds of gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, then take the responsibility seriously. If you have the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. I remember the first time I ever spoke in a church setting. I was a young Christian. We were doing a little fundraiser. I think it was for a Christmas thing. And so someone asked me, would you talk about this and elicit funds for this Christmas thing? So I said, yeah, I'll do that. It was like five minutes. And I got up and I began to speak. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but it's like you're no longer yourself. It's like something's happening through you and you just like have no control over it. That's what happened. I mean, I think the Spirit of God took over. And afterwards... A former Wheaton College professor came up to me with tears in his eyes, gave me 50 bucks and said, you really know how to make the Word of God plain. And just walked away. And I was blown away. I mean, you know even still my struggle. At least when I go in that back room, within the last couple of years, at least I don't feel like throwing up. <laughs> but it's taken all that time. And you know what I've often wondered? What if I just said No. What if at that moment when that guy asked me to do something, what if I'd have said no? Would I even be here today if I'd have said no to that back then? That's something for all of us to consider. Because no one in the kingdom of God is greater than anybody else. Isn't that amazing? That when you serve a cup of cold water, you know what's going to happen when we get to heaven? Some of us that think we're rock stars are going to be taken down a, a peg or two. We're going to think, I did these 47 things for Jesus. And somebody else is going to go in heaven. He says, all I did was feed the homeless. And God's going to look at that person and say, man, did you do what you were supposed to do? And they're going to look at you. Look at the 47,000 things you didn't do because you refused to do what I asked you to do. Wow. With greater gifts comes greater responsibility. That's kind of how it works. But the truth of the matter is we are all responsible for the gift that he gives us. That's the secret of spiritual gifts. Um, next steps. So we kind of now know what spiritual gifts are. We kind of now know how we allow the spiritual gift to be unpacked by each of us. But what about next steps? So here's what I'd say. You don't completely discover your spiritual giftings by reading the Bible or even by taking an assessment. Well, we're going to do it, allow you to do an assessment if you want. Uh, but that's not the only way you do it. You know how you primarily learn your spiritual gift? You start doing things. So I think the first thing I'd say to you is if you feel the prompting by God to do something, will you speak for five minutes about a fundraiser? If he gives you a prompting to do it, jump into it. Completely jump into it. And you know what? Ten years from now, when you have fallen flat on your face on that and that didn't work, you say, you know what I learned? I learned that wasn't my cup of tea. But you never know that if you don't step into it, right? Oh, don't sit here. Don't leave today without trying something. Because there is a gift and a project for everyone. Jesus made sure of that when he put the Holy Spirit within you. So that's the first thing I'd say. Is if he gives you a prompting, just do it. Do you feel you don't have the skills to pull it off? Yeah! Yeah! Isn't that exactly where he wants you to be? I can't do this on my own. And then pretty soon you look at the other side and say, well, somehow we got that done. It's incredible to watch how God works, but you'll never know unless you step into it. He can work in and through you. So the first thing, the number one thing to do today is take a step. And the first step I'd ask you to do is sign up today. Sign up for something. Now the trepidation part, when you walk around, we've got stuff here, we've got stuff back there, and you look for a church of 250 people, 
It'll blow your socks off what we do in this church. Seriously, seriously. And every place you'll see there is a a description of a ministry and then a sign-up sheet. And so look at all the ministries. If you don't know what this church does, just go around and look at everything that this church does. And then out in the entryway are what I guess we would call participatory ministries. So they're adult education and formation and like yada yada sisterhood or like the men's ministry or like foundry young adults ministry. These are things that you don't sign up for. That You participate in them, small groups, um, things like that. You participate in some of this stuff. And there's little flyers out there for you to be able to understand what those things are about. But with each one of these that you see in here are ministries that God needs for the church to fulfill its call. The reason those ministries are here, you need to understand something about my form of leadership. I am very hesitant if someone comes to me and they say to me, I think God wants me to do this in this church. I'm very hesitant to say, no, God hasn't told you to do that in this church. I want to release people to do what God wants them to do. And so that's just my theology of ministry. And so as many ways that I can possibly do that, unless it logistically can't be worked out, that's what I want to do. And you see that reflected in all of these. And every one of these ministries needs help. It needs the building up of the body of Christ, needs workers to build up the body of Christ. So that's the reason that it's there. And so I would say the first thing to you is to sign up. And here's what I'd say. I'd say some of you don't even know your spiritual gift today, so what am I supposed to do about that? Well, don't let your response be based on whether you know your spiritual gift or not. Remember I said that for most of us, we're going to learn our spiritual gift by doing different things. And after I've been in that children's ministry, taking care of those kids for three weeks and decide I hate kids, that's probably not the ministry for you. You know, and for some of you that say, I'm going to work on a computer or help in the office administration, and you're sitting there in administration saying, I feel like I'm locked in a prison. I need to be in children's ministry. That's how you discover it. We don't want you to be in a ministry where you're miserable. We don't want you to be in a ministry where, well, I guess they need help there, so I should do this. That's not what we want. Now, there's times that we need stuff done. We needed 35 people to serve at Nathan's wedding, and it just happened. So there's times that those things happen, and we need to use what I'd call secondary gifts. But then we want you to be fulfilled. The purpose of ministry is not for people to do work. The purpose of ministry is to become all that Jesus wants you to be. Why? Because Jesus is the main thing. So that's what we want you to do. The second thing is take a spiritual gift test. Like I said, there's a danger in this. It's that I try to focus on my positives. And I don't want to look at my weaknesses. So I want to become just complacent in my positives. Ask someone else. So there's a, there's a website there on this. It was, it's on this piece of paper at the bottom. There is a website there. And there's a lot of different ways to do uh, spiritual gift testing. This is just a really good one. Um, I think over 15,000 churches or something like that use this website for this. And so it's really a good way to do it. But then take it to someone. Say, do you agree with this? Do I really have the spiritual gift of being good looking? And, <laughs> and, and they'll say, oh, absolutely not. You know, Whatever your spiritual gift is. And you can bounce that off of other people because other people will see you. And then lastly... We have not done this class in quite a long time. Class 301, shape class. Here's what I promise you. We are doing this class in November. And shape is an acrostic. If you've been around here long enough, I honestly haven't really talked about this very much. But shape is an acrostic. It stands for spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. And it's those five things that are in your life that God created and allowed in your life to create you. And we're going to teach that class. It's a four-hour, one-day class, and we're going to teach that in November for you. So if you haven't taken that class yet, get ready to be able to do that. But with that said, we're going to now go to our offering, and uh, then I'll come up and give some instruction. Father, we come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I honor, praise, and thank you for who you are. I just give myself to you and I give this church to you. And I thank you that I can openly say we belong to you. So you do with us whatever you want to do with us and we will bring glory to your name no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen.